listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. I gotta tell you, people, back there in uh, 1982, when I was a freshman at Stockton State College in Pomona, New Jersey, my friend Bennett C. Lowe, who was from Hong Kong, came over and turned us on to all this kind of different music. And one of the bands he turned us on was Ultravox, and he always sang Vienna, and we'd have parties, he'd always sing Vienna, and I think he, uh, he turned most of that campus Author Ultravox, and my guest is the man who sang that song, who is in Ultravox. He has a ton of stuff going on, and my guest is Midge Your. How you doing, Midge? I'm doing incredibly well. I can't, I can't believe that's how you found us. <laughs> well, it's funny, because, you know, we growing up in New Jersey, we had, you know, Springsteen, stuff like that, and he came from Hong Kong, so he brought all this music that we really weren't, um, we didn't hear over here, and when we heard it, we loved it, and I mean, an Ultravox, I mean, I've become, I became a fan at that moment, because I remember he had this, he was, he was uh, from Hong Kong, but when he sang, he had a very, very deep voice, and he was singing, Vienna, and it was so <laughs> weird coming out of him. So, <laughs> I love it. So how have you been? I want to ask you, uh, tell me, tell me about the backstage lockdown club, because that's really a cool idea. It, 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 it was something I, I kind of came up with uh, from this necessity, I suppose. I mean, I, I've been, I've never, like most musicians, I, I suppose, I've never not toured in my entire life. You know, I, I, I became a professional musician when I was 18, and I've been touring since then. Uh, live work has always been a, a major thing for me, um, just as important as studio work. And uh, I found myself... Uh, two years ago now, uh, nearly two years ago now, in in Australia, in New Zealand, when we first heard about COVID, I was touring there, and then uh, the day we went from New Zealand to Australia, uh, New Zealand shut down, and and then we managed to get around most of Australia touring, and then uh, it shut down, and we had to get back. Uh, you couldn't be any further away from home, really. Um, so when I got back, I realised that this lockdown thing wasn't going away. And I, I, I had seen many artists uh, performing on the laptops, you know, just doing little you know, intimate shows, little acoustic things, and staying engaged with an audience. And, and as good as they were, as great as those artists were, and, and as good as the music was, the sound quality and the image wasn't particularly great. <laughs> so I spent three months... Uh, looking into that, like, so you like, you like this, like my little okay. multiple multi camera setup and you know, all of that stuff. So I spent three months figuring out how all this stuff worked, and then I set up the backstage lockdown club where people can still access a couple of concerts a, a month and uh, chat and uh, get various mixes of things. So it was a way of, of still being accessible. And for an audience to be accessible to me, because I needed it just as much as an audience needed it. Yeah, how do you know? How does you know your body, well, your body and mind, re react to that? When, as you said, you've been a professional, you know, musician since you're 18, you've been playing live. Well, all of a sudden, it's taken away. You know, I know some people who run long distances, and if, and if they don't run one day, they're really in a pissy mood. For yeah. you, I mean, you, you know, and like anything, I think when the when the pandemic happened in the lockdown, no one was sure. So you're probably going state, to, you know, from place to place, and you're thinking, well, we may make it through. But when it was the actual reality of you not getting that that fix, that live that live reaction, what went through your mind, and how did you react to that? The weird thing was um, because it's it's fine looking back at it and thinking, oh wow, that was eighteen months, you know. At the beginning, you didn't know it was going to be 18 months. At the beginning, it was, well, there's another week gone or there's another month gone where I've not done it. It was when you started seeing what was in the future falling apart. You started seeing your tour all of a sudden being cancelled or postponed. You started seeing your summer festivals all disappear. You started seeing your European tours all become volatile and start getting a bit wobbly and things and you realize that your entire future was in danger and and the thing is most artists can figure out a way if you're creative you'll figure out a way of surviving but the infrastructure of our industry um you know the the nuts and bolts that that make all this happen the uh, 
the the iceberg that that holds the artist at the very tip because that's what they that's what the audience see they see the they see the artist they don't see this massive amount of people underneath who make the artist uh, give them the platform to perform on um, those guys I, I I couldn't understand why they were getting no help I mean the the, the trucking system the lighting guys the sound system guys uh, you know the theaters the venues the people who work in the venues the ticket guys all of this stuff you know all just ground to a halt so um you kind of had to try and figure out what you were going to do because nobody I, I never saw the backstage lockdown club lasting a year. But it's still happening. I'm doing another one tomorrow night or the night after. It still goes on. And thank goodness it did, even though things are starting to come back, a uh, little live performance. Um, and I have to tell you, uh, I, I, my first live performance was maybe six, seven weeks ago, and it was a multi-act uh, festival in the UK. So it had... Uh, you know, ABC and Adam Ant and, you know, all of these guys on it. And everyone I spoke to, like your long distance runner, you know, like the guys who run marathons, they were all out of shape, not physically, not overweight. The voices were out of shape. You know, even though I've been singing for a year, I'm not singing the way I'd normally sing on stage. So trying to get back up to speed has been an interesting process. It's like asking someone to run a marathon without doing any training. Uh, and it's not something that I've ever had to deal with before. <laughs> All of a sudden I'm thinking, hold on, I'm human. This is a human organ. You know, it needs working. It needs to be lubricated. It needs to, it needs to get, you know, back up to speed again. And it's just an oddity that I've never, it's never, I've never experienced it before. Now, how do you plan to get that back? Is it going to be from just getting on the road and saying, okay, I know my voice isn't used to projecting to the big crowd and being in that whole system. Will is, is there anything you can do to practice right now? Or is it just something that you just have to go out there and basically sort of start from square one? Well, it's kind of like primal screaming. I think I, I just come into my little <laughs> studio and, and shout my head off every so often. A bit like going to you know, like a sports game and, and screaming for two or three hours. Uh, and hope that your voice is still there at the end of it. I think a, I think a lot of it will be psychological. Um, it, it, so it's in your head rather than your voice. Uh, I think the moment you stand up in front of an audience and get behind the mic and assume the position, uh, it just comes back. It will it will come back. It might be a little croaky. It might be a little slower than it normally is. Uh, but it, it will be there again. Isn't there? Nothing's happened to it. It's just been locked away in a cupboard somewhere has been locked away in a box and not allowed to do its thing. Now, do you worry? Like, I know you're, you're, you're coming to the States uh, in a few weeks, right? Yeah. yeah. And you'll be in my area, Philadelphia. You'll be there in November. Yeah. Do you, do you, as a performer, do you worry that you'll get over here and then something will happen and then a lockdown may happen and then your ass is stuck over here? Does that go through your mind at all or do you not worry about that? Well, it's going through my mind now, now that you've brought it up. <laughs> um, you know what? Uh, no, I think I think we have the technology to um, to overcome this stuff. I mean, something may happen and and stuff may grind to halt for a couple of weeks, um, but it's not like it was at the beginning when we had no idea what we were dealing with, when we had we had no magic bullet, we had no. Uh, vaccinations you know we have that now and anything that's happening any uh, any variant that will come along I'm sure technology will be able to, to to deal with it so it's a very different situation it's not we're not out the woods by any stretch of the imagination but we know what we have to do you know if, uh, if we're told to wear a mask wear a mask you know there's smarter people than us telling it you know you need to be injected be injected you know, I, I don't know how old you are, but, you know, I'm, I'm coming up for I'm 67. I'll be coming up for 68 in a couple of, in a week or so. Um, and at my age, you know, you, you were given your polio vaccinations. You were given this, you were given that. Nobody questioned it. You just did it because that's that's how you stop the spread. So um, so I think if we're all sensible and do the sensible stuff, 
we will overcome this. This this is something that we can probably deal with. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because I know in Philadelphia you're playing at City Winery, and I went to a concert there a few weeks ago, and they actually, you need a proof of vaccine to get in. That's the ordinance yep. of Philly. So you feel a lot safer. And what I noticed is, and you'll probably notice, and you probably noticed it a few weeks ago, we're, as music fans, we're so damn hungry. And when we see someone on stage, I mean, it's it's just, you must feel the energy because everybody's in a great mood. Uh, absolutely. Uh, as I said, it's a, it's a two-way street. It's not just an audience, you know, needing uh, music, needing performance. It's the performers needing it as much as they do. Uh, and, and it works both ways. So walking on to, you know, whatever it was, you know, the first one we did was maybe 15, 20,000 people. Uh, and they are they are gagging for it. They're just desperate to hear something live. They want to feel the power of the speakers hitting them in the chest. They want to see the performance. They want the lights. They want the smoke. They want the whole thing. Because we're humans. We, we thrive on being with other humans. We, we need that interaction. Uh, and it's something that we really, really miss. We can have music anytime. You know, we can put our headphones on, we can play a piece of music, stick some vinyl on, you know, get something on, uh, you know, stream something. Uh, there's music in television all the time, there's music in movies. We can do that anytime. But to experience music the way that we've been brought up experiencing music, in a room, in a crowd, with someone doing something in front of you live, there's a buzz involved in that that you cannot recreate you know, television's not a great medium for music. It looks fine, but it doesn't have that. It doesn't have atmosphere. You know, and that atmosphere is something you can only get by sitting in the audience, with or without your mask, whatever it happens to be, with your inoculations, watching someone doing something live. I still get a kick out of it when I get great musicians to come and play on something that I've written. I sit there and the hair in the back of my neck stands up watching a great bass player or watching a great drummer putting their skills into something of mine. And and I hope that never dies. You know, I hope that never dies. Now, you know, you, you've been immersed in music your whole life. Is that why you're coming out with a, I know you're having a book coming out called In a Picture Frame of your photography. When did you start taking photography? When did you become a photographer or start taking a lot of pictures and what made you decide to finally bring out a book I um I think the I didn't I didn't really know anything about photography until I joined Ultravox when I joined Ultravox 1979 it turns out that Chris the bass player and Warren the drummer uh, uh, both had 35 mil cameras and I I'd, I'd never held one and I became fascinated with the idea of being able to capture a moment um, in black and white, uh, like an old film noir movie. And um, and I, 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 I vowed that when I first generated any money at all, I would treat myself to a 35 millimeter camera. And it's like anything. It's like it's like a drug. You know, you, you buy the camera, but then that's not quite enough. You have to have the lens and then you have to have the wide angle lens and you have to get this so you find yourself with all this stuff all this kit uh, and none of the skills um and slowly but surely you you start to understand the whole process and because uh, i think ultravox it, it, you you know what our uh, our music media used to be like here it was brutal it was vicious uh, they could rip you to shreds for, for no apparent reason other than the fact that you weren't cool in their, eye, uh, their eyes. And we wouldn't trust having journalists or photographers around us. So we ended up taking the photographs. We ended up documenting uh, moments in time that no one else could, could get. Um, like anyone, you know, we're all different people when you take off the public persona. Uh, you know, you're a different person with your wife than you are with your mates. You know, you're, you're a different person, you know, going to a gig than they are going to a sports event or whatever. We, we, we're all multiple characters. And I, we got to document Ultravox offstage. We got to document the travelling. We got to document sitting backstage. We got to document things that I, I wouldn't expect. Things like shots of us in America doing the first tour. Uh, and looking at the cars and thinking, to me, that's only a couple of years ago. No, it's 40 years ago, and the cars are ancient, 
and the, the buildings look different. And so you capture these little moments in time, like a time capsule, like a time machine. Uh, and then when I started flicking through these things, which I had kind of dismissed for years, the, the photographs got ruined and the, 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 the negatives were all wet. And, you know, so we cleaned them all up. And then I find I've got all these this fantastic documentation of, you know, shooting Ultravox videos or directing videos for Visage or Banana Rama or Funboy 3 or Phil Lynott from Thin Lizzy. And, and you think, well, I, this is this is gold. This is this is like discovering an archive that didn't exist. And I got very excited about the idea of putting this together as like a body of work. Now, tell me about how you got into music, because you've, you've had a fascinating career. I know at one point you were like juggling three bands at one time, which is just amazing. I mean, what was there a defining moment that made you fall in love with music or what made you start? Um, I, I remember uh, being a being a geeky kid at school, uh, you know, not being good at sport. You know, I couldn't play football. I was I wasn't interested in it. Um and, and I remember going to the Saturday morning cinema. The kids used to go to the, the, the cinema, the cinema matinee, and um, and seeing uh, a, a pop star that we had over here. When when you guys had Elvis, we had a we had a kind of sawn off Elvis, a guy called Tommy Steele. And there was a movie, Tommy Steele, and he had a guitar. And the moment he picked up his guitar and started playing on stage, all the girls loved him. And I thought. That's for me. <laughs> I, I, could, I could do with that kind of help, you know. Uh, so I, I, I became obsessed with guitars. And I got a guitar when I was 10 years old, taught myself how to play a few tunes. I always had a voice because that didn't cost anything. I was, I was naturally lucky in that respect. I, I could sing. Um, and it was a dream, really. The reality was I was from a very poor working class family. My destiny was kind of mapped out for me. Um, you know, I would leave school at 15 uh, and go into uh, engineering. I'd be a mechanic or a, uh, you know, a lathe worker or, a, you know, something. I'd have a skill at my fingertips and music would be a sideline. And I was for I was fortunate. I was lucky. You know, I, I, I fell into things. I was in the right place at the right time. And, and it's all right saying, well, you know, you're quite a skilled songwriter. I wasn't. You know, I was I was a guy who could sing other people's songs. And you learn. You you end up finding yourself in situations where, you know, you meet a friend with a guitar and all of a sudden you meet someone who's got a drum and a cymbal and before you know it, you've got the nucleus of a band. And it just goes from there. And if you're lucky, it rolls on into something else. So I could quite easily have have disappeared after after my first success in the UK with a uh, I was in a band called Slick and we had a number one record the very kind of base of Tirolos type thing written by and produced by the same people in fact if I tell you the truth played by the same people uh, as the base of Tirolos uh, song because that's how you were treated in those days you it didn't matter if you were a musician or not um, and I grew out of that I was lucky enough to move on from there. Uh, join a band with ex Sex Pistol Glenn Matlock, uh, bought a synthesizer in 1978, introduced it to the band. It immediately broke the band up, and the half the band who liked it went on and formed Visage. That was Rusty Egan and I. Now, and through working on Visage, I ended up joining Ultravox. Now, how, how, what made you decide to introduce? The synthesizer, because it, it was a different time. I was talking to Pete Byrne from Naked Eyes, and he said when they first you know, came out, they, they wouldn't have music, the instruments to tour. They didn't have anything they could take with you. What what caught you about, what was it that drew you to the synthesizer? I think I think the, the idea of an instrument that could create uh, atmosphere uh, instantly, an instrument that was as limited as uh, your imagination, uh, that was kind of infinite. You know, I can still go back to old synthesizers today and create sounds that I didn't create back then, um, just by delving deeper and deeper and deeper into them, by experimenting more. Um, so the idea of that was fascinating. At the time, the synthesizer was the price of a small house. Uh, you could, nobody could afford one. You know, I didn't know anybody who owned a synthesizer. But timing um, uh, and technology all landed at the same time. 
when I was in a band with my guitar and my amplifier and all of the standard instrumentation that you'd have, uh, Japanese technology came along and it wasn't just Moog synthesizers, which were uberly expensive, but all of a sudden the Japanese manufacturers started making these things at, at, at a much reduced price. So you could get your hands on a synthesizer. When you speak to the guys from you know, the Human League, uh, who were using synthesizers back in 1978 and, and some of the, the British electro pop things that were coming out at the time. They all started with Japanese synthesizers because that's what they could afford. That and a tape machine, and all of a sudden you've got the facility to make a record without going into a recording studio. It was a technological revolution uh, that, that enabled us to be able to do that. Once I found a band who would put up with a synthesizer, of course, <laughs> Now, how did Thin Lizzy come? I just, you know, because you see your, your music, you know, your lineage. And then Thin Lizzy, it, it's just, it's an odd, it's an odd fit. And uh, it's just because you always think of boys are back, just that kind of thing. How did Thin Lizzy come about? I mean, what, did they, did they know your music from Visage or how did they know you? I, um, I, I saw the very early Thin Lizzy playing in a tiny rock club in, in Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, when they were a three-piece, before they'd even brought out the first album. They brought out an EP, I think, um, uh, because, because I had read in the paper that they were associated somehow with the original Skid Row, who were an Irish band, a three-piece band, with a young Gary Moore, a 16-year-old guitar wizard. And I saw the Skid Row, then I went to see Thin Lizzy because they had an association. And I fell in love with the music. I, they were great. As a I was 15 at the time, 14 or 15, so I was an aspiring guitar player. Um, so I, I was into rock music. I, want, I wanted to see how these guys did this. Um, so I, I already knew Thin Lizzy's catalogue and what they did. And I got to meet Philip uh, a couple of times uh, after shows and things. And when I moved to London uh, to join the Rich Kids in 1977, I bumped into Phil. I bumped into Phil Line at coming out a tube station in London. And as I was going in, and I said, you won't remember me? He said, yeah, I do, the kid from Glasgow. And we, we hung out. Um, so I told him what I was doing. I bought the synthesizer. I told him my band was uh, was just about to fall apart. I was doing Visage. And, uh, and, 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 and for whatever reason, I was in the studio. I'd just joined Ultravox. I was in the recording studio putting the finishing touches to uh, Visage's Fade to Grey, uh, which has become a bit of a, an electronic classic since then. And I get a phone call from Phil, uh, who's in Arkansas. And he phones up and he said, we're opening up for Journey. We're playing these megadomes. And Gary's not in the band anymore. Can you come out tomorrow and finish the tour? <laughs> and, uh, and you think, well, initially, why me? And then secondly, you think, I've never been to America. Yes, of course I'll come out uh, and I'll figure it all out later. So why they asked me to be guitarist, I, I will never know. I think Philip thought that I knew all of Thin Lizzy's material, which of course I didn't. Um, and I find myself uh, arriving in America with my ghetto blaster, my headphones, uh, having expected to learn all the songs on the flight and the way over. And of course, they flew me out on Concord. And I, I hadn't learned anything. It was three hours. <laughs> you can't learn anything in three hours. So I found my first night in American soil in New Orleans, which looked nothing like America in the French Quarter, <laughs> learning all the harmony guitar parts for the Thin Lizzy set. And the next night I'm on stage, uh, opening up for Journey in front of 20,000 people. It was crazy. What was that like? I mean, you know, as you said, you're, you're learning the music, then all of a sudden you're smack dab into a packed house in a, a country you've never been to. I'm sure you were never in front of a crowd that size. I mean, what was what was going through your mind when you walked on stage and saw, I'm sure you don't see the people in the upper deck, you just saw a sea of people. Yeah, tumbleweed, I think. Um, you know, it was like, I, I was so petrified um, because every song, uh, you know, with Thin Lizzy at the time, had a harmony guitar riff or a harmony guitar part uh, in it. 
and they were almost interchangeable. <laughs> you could almost play the, the you know the harmony guitar part from the boys are back in town and put it in Emerald. You know, it's like it, it's every song, and, and I'm, I was petrified I was going to put the wrong one in the wrong song, and um, and, and I, I got through, uh, and it was fine. Once you've got two or three of them under your belt, you kind of relax into it. Um, but the, the, the amazing thing for me was experiencing the tail end of that American rock period, the late 70s, you know, when, you know, kids would turn up in their Trans Ams uh, to come and watch, you know, Journey, to, to, hear, to hear these anthemic, you know, Americana tunes. And I was there as, as, a, as like an observer. You know, my musical head was a million miles away from, from what we were doing. It was great fun, and I loved the whole thing about uh, touring around America and being part of Thin Lizzy, simply because I knew that I joined Ultravox, and I was going back in a month or so to get into a recording studio or to get into a rehearsal studio and write the Vienna album. That's where my heart lay. Uh, so to, to watch all of this unfold around me, uh, the you know the, the, this the, the stories of you know kids turning up uh, you know pissed off because they didn't get in so they drove their car through the front doors of the, the you know the the the, 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 the the stadium in Miami and you think oh my god I've read about stuff like this but now I'm experiencing it it was invaluable it was it was a great learning curve but musically my head was somewhere totally different. How did you end up in Ultravox? Because they had they were around before you, uh, before you joined. How did how did you end up with them? And when you joined, did you feel some pressure? Because all of a sudden, you know, as you said, you're writing the album Vienna, and it's you're the new guy. You know, what I mean, what what was the whole trans thing transgression? Well, I, I, I suppose the, the, Billy Billy Curry, the keyboard player uh, from Ultravox, the main synthesizer player, uh, violinist. Um, who was one of the founding members. Um, uh, I, I, we'd already chosen him to be part of Visage. Visage was a studio project uh, put together by Rusty and myself uh, to as a vehicle for Steve Strange. Uh, so we chose all our favourite musicians from the bands that we loved at the time. So Billy Curry from Ultrabox. We chose the musicians from the band Magazine, uh, who were just great musicians. And we put them all together in the studio and came up with Visage. So we, we already had a working rapport together uh, because Ultravox was still Ultravox at the time. They were a five-piece band. John Fox was a singer. Uh, they went to America and came back a broken band. Uh, they, they, they broke apart. They fell apart during the tour. John left the band. Robin met some girl and went off there. So the nucleus of the band, the drums, bass and keys, came back to the UK not knowing what they were doing next. And it was my friend Rusty Egan who said to Billy, you're stupid, he's the guy. He's the guy you should have in the band. I was too shy to suggest it. But Rusty said, no, he's the guy. He writes songs, he's a great guitar, he does this, he does that. So uh, we, we put the money that we had in our pockets together and went into a rehearsal studio for three hours, I think it was. That's all we could afford. We had nothing to make a noise and see if the noise was any good. And the noise was phenomenal. The noise was amazing. It was the most exciting thing I'd ever heard in my life. This combination of electronic bass, acoustic drums, electronic drums, guitar, violin, synthesizer. It was just, it was like nothing I'd ever heard before. So it was the most exciting thing ever. Now, when the first album with you comes out, when how long till it starts getting buzz? I mean, you know, because it, it was popular, but how long till people started going, damn, you got to hear that? I think it was it was almost almost instant, but on a small scale. Uh, we went out when the album was released. Uh, we went out and did a handful of shows around the UK, small clubs. Uh, clubs that the band had been playing anyway, that I'd been playing with, with the Rich Kids. Uh, we, we went out and did a little bit of that circuit. And I remember playing um, Eric's, a very famous club in Liverpool, in Carnaby Street, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, next to the Cavern, I should say, in, in Matthews Street. And, um, and I remember somebody phoning a hotel uh, just before we went down for the sound check and said, 
There's a massive line of people outside all waiting to get in because we had had the first single from the album was getting played on the radio, uh, Sleepwalk. And uh, and we couldn't believe it. So we turned up to this club and it was jammed. Uh, it, partly an audience of the curious who were already Ultravox fans and they wanted to see how the new boy would handle <laughs> would handle the job replacing John Fox. Um, and luckily I came out with, with good reviews. Uh, but it was it was really when uh, maybe the second single had come out and we were playing much larger venues. Uh, we were playing the Hammersmith Odeon in London, so it was like a 4,000 capacity venue. And the record label at the time had been insisting that Vienna should come out as a single, but they wanted to edit it because it was over four minutes long. And we refused. We just kept saying no. We're not cutting it down. I mean, how how do you chop down, you know, Hey Jude? And how do you chop down Bohemian Rhapsody? And how do you chop down Kate Bush's Wuthering Heights? It is what it is. It's a piece of music. It's a start and a middle and an end. What do you cut out, you know, in order to get it on the radio? And that night, the record label were there. And when we played Vienna, just a track off the album, the whole place erupted. The whole place stood on their feet and just went crazy. And the, lab- the record label came to us at the end and said, Okay, yeah, okay, you win. Let's put it out in its entirety and see what happens. And we got one play on the radio, and the reaction was phenomenal. It was ridiculous. So at that point, everything changed. How did your life change? You know, you, you sit there, you know, you're a guy who's been a musician for a, a long time, you know, and you've already been in front of mega crowds in, in the US, even though it wasn't your full passion you were some your mind was with ultravox all of a sudden how does your life change when you have a hit and you're somewhat the toast of the town i mean how do you keep it together i i, I think the simple answer is that you don't uh, i think you, you 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 we're all we're all potential megalomaniacs uh, and give us give us the right scenario and we can become little hitlers you know we're not, we're not, you know people people are odd and if someone starts telling you you're really good at what you're doing or adulating you or putting you on a pedestal, that can easily go to your head. And I'm sure it probably did in, in many different ways. Um, the thing that really changed was the fact that someone gave us the tools to the toolbox. You know, all of a sudden, you could let your imagination run wild. Uh, stage sets, lighting, uh, you know, putting something on that was a spectacle, you know, not just explosions and stuff but but creating an atmosphere creating a stage that would give you the right setting for the atmosphere for the music that you are creating um so that side of things got got crazy um and and of course ultravox being ultravox we insisted that the show we did in london was the same show we did in los angeles was the same show we did in sydney was the same show we did in tokyo Uh, so we would cart this massive piles of stuff ship it all around the world which cost a, a, an absolute fortune so that everyone got the same experience. Um, and uh, it was just one of our foibles, uh, but also gave you the, the facility to go and experiment more in the studio. So the follow-up album to Vienna, which was recorded in three weeks, recorded and mixed in three weeks, was Rage in Eden, which we wrote and recorded entirely in Connie Plank's studio in Germany. It took three months. Um, but it's an album that we're immensely proud of. So we, we were allowed to experiment a bit more than, than than just come up with another album that sounded a bit like Vienna, which is what labels want. Now, what was the difference when you came to the States with Ultravox, a completely different um, group? You're not going to have guys drinking Budweiser with cut-off shirts and Camaros coming to see Ultravox. I mean, it's, it's a more of a hip, cool crowd. What was your experience when you came and... How did you enjoy that experience? Because now you were the star before you were in Thin Miz, Lizzy, but now you're the man. What was that like? Well, it was, it, we, we went back to the clubs again. You know, uh, we, we realized it was starting all over again, really, in America. You know, the coasts were fine. Anywhere that a college radio was fine um, because, you know, your music was being heard there. 
but there's a great big bit in the middle <laughs> of America <laughs> that, that nobody had ever heard of you. So it wasn't until the advent of MTV, and even then it was quite sparse that MTV uh -huh. it wasn't in everyone's household. You know, you had to pay for MTV. You had to have the right cable channel, you know, whatever it was, the cable package and things. So it was in its infancy. But when that happened, uh, you know, MTV didn't have any content. You know, America wasn't making videos. It was... It had the facility to show videos. The Brits were making the videos, but we didn't have anything to show it on. So for the first six months of MTV, you couldn't move for, you know, the police and Squeeze and, you know, Ultravox and, you know, China Crisis and whoever uh, was around at the time uh, because they needed the content. We were, we were providing the content. And, of course, once America started doing their own, versions of videos the, the the brits were kind of pushed to one side by which point you know the police were massive you know or you know the cure were massive um so it was a, an interesting process uh, going back and starting again in the clubs but the the acceptance of the american audience whether it be in you know you know oregon or you know arkansas was the same you know, I remember standing in front of a sea of cowboy hats in Texas, <laughs> thinking we're, we're going to be killed here. We, we've, got, we've got blusher on, we've got makeup on, sucking our cheeks in. We're standing behind a bank of synthesizers. <laughs> we're going to be crucified, you know. And they loved it. It was a, it was a, a the, because it was a rock band. Ultravox were a rock band that used technology, so it was powerful and it was, it was something you could move to. It wasn't just atmospherics. It wasn't all about, you know plink, plonk, plink, plonk, and sucking your cheeks in. It was something beyond that. Now, as you're in Ultravox, and you guys come out with music, and I, I, uh, Dancing with Tears in My Eyes, I, every once in a while when I have a little buzz after a few glasses of wine, I always tell Alexa to play that because I love that song. But at what point, when you were in Ultravox, were you also thinking about a solo career? Well, I didn't think of a solo career, to tell you the truth. I mean, it, it kind of it fell into place. Um, uh, I, 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 I'd always loved um, uh, No Regrets. I, I'd heard the, the Walker Brothers version of it. Um, I, I'd never heard um, the, the, the original version. And, and I said one day that, you know, given the opportunity, I would go into a studio and do my interpretation of it. And I did it in a day. So a friend of mine gave me studio time for a, for a day um, before I had my own facilities. And, uh, and I knocked that off and it went out and it was weirdly successful. Uh, but I had no plans on leaving Ultravox. Um, and it wasn't until maybe four years in uh, with Ultravox, uh, we'd been writing, touring, recording, writing, recording, touring, nonstop for like a four year period. And we decided to take a six month break. And at this point I had my own facilities. I'd built my own studio uh, uh, at home. And I started dabbling with stuff that was just simple, some instrumental music, some, some slightly popular tunes. And before I knew it, I ended up with a solo album. Uh, and I put that out. And, you know, if I was, that, you know, the, the main track from the, from the album uh, became a massive hit. It was, you know, kind of number one record in the UK. And I, I think the big worry at the time was, you know, was I going to leave the band? And I had no intention of leaving the band. But, of course... Band Aid and Live Aid all kind of happened around that same period. And that took me away from Ultravox for two years. And if anything broke the band up, it was it was that rather than the desire to make a solo record. Tell me about Band Aid. I mean, you know, because you know, it's one of those things that growing up, I grew up outside 10 minutes from Philadelphia. And I still look back, I'm still pissed I never went to a Live Aid in Philly. It's the, it was on TV here. We could watch it. It was in London. It was sure. one of those things you never saw. Sure whole concerts on TV. How did that come about? How did you get involved with that? Well, weirdly, um, I, I was with Bob last night, um, Geldof. Uh, it's, it's, uh, they were doing a big celebratory. It's his 70th birthday. And I'm, I'm going to say that again. His 70th birthday, because I'm sick to death of reading articles where it says that I'm actually older than him. Um, <laughs> so I, I was at this thing with him last night, and we were t there was a lot to talk about live in Band-Aid. Uh, and it's, it's simple. We'd, we'd been friends. Uh, the Boomtown Rats were kind of on the decline. Uh, Bob had seen the initial footage on the BBC uh, news uh, of the famine in Ethiopia. And uh, I happened to be doing a television show that his 
girlfriend, soon to become wife, uh, was hosting uh, in the other end of the UK in Newcastle. And uh, she handed me the phone and said, he wants to talk to you. And he said, I've just seen this thing. It's disgusting. These people are dying and they need help. And the, the rats aren't in a position to do it. And I'm not in a position to do it. Will you help? Because Ultravox was still riding high. And uh, we met up a couple of days later and came to the fairly obvious conclusion that we're skilled at nothing except maybe writing the odd song and, and, and decided that if we, if we could get ourselves a Christmas number one in the UK um, with as much help as we could possibly get, um, the charts freeze over Christmas and New Year. And, uh, so you get maybe a three or four week run at number one and you can generate twice as much money as you normally would uh, with a number one any other time of the year. Um, that, that we might be able to raise £100,000, so, you know, $150,000, which was realistic uh, based on the royalties that an artist was getting from a label at the time. And, of course, none of us saw what this seed of an idea would would develop into, you know, the, the whole idea of artists giving up their time and, and putting in their quality and, and talents and, and fan base to make this this kind of unique event happen. Um, you know, so so Band Aid spurned Live Aid. You know, so it just once once the once the initial pebbles start to roll down the hill, you know, it turns into an avalanche. And it's the, you get caught up in it, and all of a sudden, you know, you're doing something that isn't a six month project. You're doing something that's a thirty seven year project. You know. Now, what was the feel like in the studio when you recorded that? Because there's there was a lot of egos. I mean, and you know, there's so many stars, but and you were, you were like you and Bob were the captain somewhat. You know, it was it was your gig, and you helped write the song. What was it like hurting all those people? It sounded like was it hard, or was everyone just there and ready to work, or did you have little people going, "I wanted to sing this part here"? I mean, what happened? Well, I, I was kind of locked to the um, the mixing desk. Uh, you know, I was I was producing the record, so I I never really. Uh, got out to see what they were all up to outside. I think Bob was more the host, you know. I was the wor- I was the worker bee, and he was the queen bee, and he was out there looking after all the the, the drones, and um, and it kind of worked, you know. The, the the egos really were left at the the front door, you know. There, there was no food, uh, there was no drinks, uh, there was nothing. There was no catering. Uh, so if anybody there wanted to go out and buy a sandwich, they had to go and buy a sandwich. There was no one to go and get it for them. So it was incredibly low key. It was very, very different from from We Are the World. You know, it's a whole no no limos. You know, people turned up. You know, I think Banana Rama turned up in a Volkswagen Golf, and uh, Paul Weller from uh, turned up in the the underground. Um, so people just made their way there. No record labels, no flunkies, no management, none of that. Um, so it was incredibly basic. They were all there to do a job, and they did the job unbelievably well. Um, the hardest part was assigning who was going to sing which line, which, weirdly, we hadn't even thought of. It hadn't crossed our minds that we would have to divide this song up into into sections because we didn't have time for everyone to sing the song because you have to remember, they all turned up on the day without having heard it. There was no way of playing on the song that they could learn it or decide whether they wanted to put their name to it or not. They had committed before they even walked in and heard the first note. So they all had to learn the song. Uh, so it, the reality was I had to assign them a line and then leave a crossover point where someone else was going to take over and and then assemble this jigsaw later. Now, Live Aid, because I've heard stories... From, I've interviewed a lot of people who played Live Aid, some in America, some over in London. What was it like for you? And once again, it was such a giant crowd. I mean, what was the feel? I heard the feel backstage. Everyone was just, in, it was a lot of camaraderie. Everyone was in a great mood. What do you What do you remember from playing Live Aid? I think prior to the concert, uh, at least... The majority of the artists who were performing on the UK side were all pushed into a great big kind of green room. Uh, and looking around the room, there was a great buzz going on, a lot of nervousness, uh, because this this was a first, uh, you know, to have a, a, a televised 
global concert. I mean, we were all petrified. And uh, one of our, you know, heritage bands here that, that never really made it in America, at, at status quo, uh, were, were chosen to kick off the show. And we're all standing around nervously and, uh, you know, breaking into our con- kind of component types of artists so that the rockers were all standing in one corner and the, the kind of, you know, the new wave guys were all standing together chatting and it was, it was odd and um, a lot of giggling going on, uh, nervous giggling. And then status quo opened up with rocking all over the world and we all relaxed because it had become real at that point. Up until that point, it was still a fantasy. And all of a sudden, we had the music backstage of them kicking, you know, and here we are, and here we are, and here we go, rocking all over the world, you know. It was fantastic. So it just changed. The atmosphere changed instantly. And people relaxed and started to enjoy it and started to look forward to their 18 minutes on stage and worrying about what they were going to do in their section as opposed to the overall day and how the day would go. So it was quite something. Now, did you put your set list together for for Ultravox or did you guys all work with the other or did you just say, we're going to play the hits? How did you come up with it? We had to simplify, um, we had to choose the songs that used the least equipment. You know? <laughs> this is at a time when Ultravox toured with 26 synthesizers on stage <laughs> because that's the only way we could actually perform live. You, you couldn't make the sound changes quick enough. Um, so we chose four songs uh, that didn't require a massive amount of equipment uh, because even then the technology was very flaky to use on stage. Um so Vienna, uh, we managed to do with the most basic equipment. Uh, and the other songs were, were mainly, I think Reap the Wild One was on there. Uh, it used used maybe four or five keyboards as opposed to the 26 that we'd normally have because there was no sound check. You had to walk on and, and, and kind of keep everything crossed that when you hit your guitar or hit the key, a noise came out. Um, so once once we'd relaxed into it and realised that this was actually working and happening, uh, we, we, we stuck to sim- simplistic songs, you know, or, you know, One Small Day and uh, whatever. So we kept it to guitar-oriented things more than synthesizer-oriented things. Now... After Ultravox, you've been you've had a long solo career. I actually saw you at the Greek in L.A. I lived in L.A. in 2014. It was with uh, Thomas Bailey, Howard Jones, Katrina, and I believe China Crisis was on it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, when you go out on your own, how do you decide what musicians you're going to use? And is it is it a little should we say scary the first in your when you were first getting on stage by yourself? Because I'm sure. You and the guys in Ultravox had formed such a trust and you knew how you played, plus you had 27 synthesizers. What was it like when you started going out on your own and have you felt that you've grown a lot falling into that, being comfortable with that position? Well, I think you do grow. You constantly grow. Um, You know, I'm not the same person I was, you know, 35 years ago. Um, I write very different types of songs. I I think differently. I think think in a very, um, you know... uh, changed uh, format you know when you're when you're young and naive you know you think you can con- conquer the world and if you believe that you probably can um, so there's a naivety involved uh, when you start writing things like <clears throat> like Vienna or whatever that I wouldn't do now I wouldn't have that naivety maybe I've lost that and an innocence that, that kind of disappears and something else takes over so um, yeah I you know what going out on your own for the first time it, it it takes extra rehearsal. Uh, you choose your musicians well. You choose people that you uh, that you know you've got to spend a lot of time with. So not just for the you know great musicianship, but for the character. Um, so you choose people that you can spend three months on a bus with uh, because uh, you better like these people. They better like you. Otherwise, it's a disaster waiting to happen. It's like a marriage, but a marriage with a variety of people, you know, multiple marriage. And you've all got to get on through the, the thick and thin and the highs and lows. Um, so that's always been a, a, a dominant factor in, in choosing a band. I don't really get scared about stuff now. I don't really get nervous about it because if you've rehearsed it 
well enough. You you feel confident it's going to happen. The first night of a show is always a bit nerve wracking. There's always the ten minute manic chat that you have with all the musicians going right and straight after the song you've got to go straight to that <clears throat> and then you've got to hit this noise and then you've got to start the hi-hat there and and then when that one finishes you've got to go so you have this mad and you walk on and you've forgotten everything you said you know it all just happens it just works and if it doesn't work you get through it because only you know what should be happening you know the audience are just happy that it's, they're up there making the noise and watching what's going on so it's not an, it's not really a nerve-wracking thing that it, that it used to be you know once you've got the first one under your belt you're fine what was the 80 tour 1980 tour did you I, it's on your website you're gonna do the palladium did that ever go off or what happened and and what was that was this just a compilation of your like two of your albums I think sometimes you have to remind people of what you what you've done, um, uh, and, and what you're capable of doing. And for for many years, I haven't gone out uh, in the UK and done uh, full blown shows. I've done intimate acoustic things or <clears throat> or the odd band show, or whatever. And I wanted to go back and say to people, okay, here's something you remember. Here's a celebratory thing. I'm going back nearly forty years, and I'm going to play two albums. I'm going to do the VN album from Ultravox and I'm going to do the first Visage album, the majority of it. I'll, I'll pick and choose what, what I'm doing. But I'm going to do it well and I'm going to do it properly and I'm going to do it with a proper light show and a stage set and put all the, all the toys, all the tools that I have at my fingertips and put it all out there. And I called it the 1980 tour because it was 1980 that both those albums were released. And it was a huge success. It was fantastic. And it gave me the taste of, of going back out and doing that level of show again, uh, to the extent that uh, I'm doing another one uh, in spring next year, 2022, uh, that was postponed from this year. Uh, and that's the Voice and Visions Tour, where I'm doing uh, Ultravox's uh, uh, Lament. Uh, no, I'm doing the Ultravox's Rage and Eden album and the Quartet album. Uh, so two very different records but uh, at the same time, the same evening. Uh, so it's something that I really wanted to do, but it's, it's again, it's so it's so difficult to bring that across to America because the, the desire to have it, not from an audience, but from promoters uh, to, to put something like that on is, is kind of thin. You know, I can maybe, I can maybe scrape getting a show on either coast, but other than that, it becomes a massive dinosaur of a thing that you have to cart across to, to do so, I find myself in a situation where it's almost impossible to 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 do something like that on that level uh, in the states, which is a real pity because people would love to see uh, what the rest of the world gets. You know. Now your tour coming to America. What can the people expect? Let's say I come to see you. Uh, it's Sunday, October first. It's funny. It's my birthday weekend, and uh, I think the 29th I'm going to see uh, Dave Wakeling invited me to see the English beat and the fix. And then it's like an eighties weekend for me. I'll spend Saturday with my wife and I'll probably come see you. I'll take the train into Philly. What can I expect when I come to see you at city winery? Are you going to do, how are you going to put your set list together? Is it going to be a, is it going to be a retrospect of your whole career or what can I expect? I think it'd be a bit of, a bit of everything really. Um, you know, I'm not one of those artists that says, well, you know, I, I can't stand playing Vienna anymore. I can't stand playing Dance with Tears. Um, you know, when when those things start to become a bit of an albatross around your neck, uh, you you rework them. Uh, you have to you have to understand it, and it's a it's a vast realization that I've only had recently, is that no matter how large or small a crowd you're playing in front of, half of that crowd doesn't want to be there because they've been dragged along by the significant other half who probably only knows Vienna or Fade to Grey or whatever. So you've already got half the audience that you've got to try and convert, you know. So you don't want to alienate the good half by not playing the songs that really got them there in the first place. So I have a very pragmatic view on that stuff. But I do, uh, I do need to play newer stuff, uh, stuff that's maybe a little bit more obscure, because I think they're much better songs. You know, I'm a songwriter. Uh, I'm very proud of some of the things that I've done. Uh, and weirdly, through the Backstage Lockdown Club uh, and people requesting 
songs, which I don't usually do. I don't usually do re requests. They've requested songs that I've never performed live, and I've had to go and learn them to sit here and uh, and do them for them. So I'm armed with a wealth of material that I've never performed live in front of an audience. So I'll be coming with some of that. The key to any of these things is the mixture, is the balance between what people hope to hear and what people will maybe hopefully walk away having heard, thinking that's the new favourite. One final question. You know, in, in the last, probably the last 20 years, it's weird because the 80s were 40 years ago, but there's been a huge, there's been a huge resurgence in the 80s. The people, you know, younger people are listening to it. Why do you why do you think that has happened? Why do you think there's been a resurgence in the eighties? And a second part of that question is, what has kept you going that people still enjoy you? I think the 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 eighties is still alive and kicking and vibrant because of the internet. I think because there are specific specific stations now that that play nothing but. That, that era, that genre, that decade. Um, and that's kept the music alive. Uh, I think, uh, in fact, I know that um, you know, film directors and, and game designers um, are from, from that era. You know, they were kids growing up listening to, you know, to Ultravox or The Cure or Depeche Mode or, or whatever. And they are now creating the vehicles that use those tunes. So I see requests for Fade to Grey and, and Dancing with Tears and, and If I Was and all of those things that I've done 35 years ago, 30, 30 35 years ago, uh, all coming in uh, to be used in movies, uh, to be used in Netflix uh, films, to be used in whatever. Uh, video games, it's an entire different generation playing video games, listening to music in the background, and falling in love with it, that I recorded in 1982. And nobody saw that coming. Nobody saw it coming. You know, music, when we made these these pieces of music, they had a shelf life of six months. And we thought, well, the only time they'll ever get played on national radio again is when one of the band dies. You know, it's like when they go, oh, sorry, the, the poor old mid years died today. Here's one of his songs, you know. <laughs> and that's the reality of it. That's, they, they have a life beyond everything that we ever expected. Um, and because songwriting was king in the 1980s, songwriting was everything. It wasn't about the beats. It wasn't about the BPM. It wasn't about raving in a tent or a field somewhere off your face on E. It was about listening to the lyrics and someone telling your story you're reading your life story into someone else's song and that's what music always did for people you know you it resonates with people you've never met and people whose story you don't know because their story is very similar to the story you're telling and that's that's a life forever and so why are people still loving you i think because i'm fairly honest uh, i i i strive to 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 keep the bar high and and that sounds like dreadful a dreadfully egotistical thing to say and and probably is um but i i don't just throw records out there i t i take you know eight ten years between making albums which is ludicrous so every time every time i, I go back out there again it's like starting all over because i don't want to just recreate what i've done in the past i want to find you know new interesting ways of touching subjects, of approaching subjects, of making music. Um, because the only critic that matters is your family. And when I'm gone, I want my four daughters to look back at my catalogue and go, that was the best he could have done at that moment in time. And that's the best thing ever. Well, that's awesome, Midge. I want to thank you so much. People, you got to go to Midge's website. It's Midge, I-M-D-G-E-U-R-E dot C-O dot U-K. I know he's on Twitter a lot. Go follow him on Twitter. Go back, listen to his music. Listen to some Ultravox this weekend. It's the weekend. Crack a bottle of red wine, put on some Ultravox, you're going to be a happy person. Uh, also, people go to my website, coopertalk.net. You can find over 875 episodes there. You can email me, cooper at coopertalk.net. Twitter is at coopertalk. Instagram at coopertalk1. Remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. And don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.